Hello, in this video we'll cover basic issues related to income tax of estates and trusts. Now what exactly is a trust? It's important to note that the term trust is not actually defined in the tax code. It usually refers to an arrangement created by a will or by an inter vivos, which is Latin for lifetime, declaration. The trustee has to take title to property for purposes of protecting or conserving it for beneficiary. And a trust is used to archive various financial and other goals. So there's, other, there's multiple purposes of goals with respect to trust. A lot of times, maybe someone is putting money into a trust for purposes of, okay, upon re re um, retirement, they get the money out. Or maybe they have a child and the child is young, so they're putting money away in trust so that the child doesn't get the money early on. They go spend it, you know, blow all their money at Disney World, right? Um, it's, it's, there, there's various goals, and I'll talk about some of the, the main types of trust out there in a moment. Typically, there's at least three parties involved in a trust. The first is the grantor. The grantor is the party that transfers various assets, whether they're financial assets, you know, stock, bonds, cash, investments. Usually it's investments. can be um, any type of property, a business, various things, to the trust entity. This is sometimes referred to the grantor is sometimes referred to as the settler or the donor. The trustee is the party that is charged with the fiduciary duties associated with the trust. Usually they get some type of management fee, but they're the ones that need to be managing and making sure the trust is doing its goals. It's, it's building, it's, it's gaining in size so that upon whatever event occurs, it will have more than simply just what was originally put in by the grantor. Now this can either be an individual or a corporation. The beneficiary is the third party. This is the party, and there can be many beneficiaries, but there has to be at least one that's designated to receive income or property from the trust, again, at some point um, along a, a timeline. So as I mentioned, trusts are all about certain goals. There's some major types of trusts out there. The first is a life insurance trust. A life insurance trust holds a life insurance policy on the insured. A lot of times you'll hear this referred to as um, an islet, irrevocable, irrevocable life insurance trust. This is a common term, I-L-I-T. It removes proceeds of policies from the gross estate if it's um, irre irrevocable, which is the islet purpose. So it brings it out of the gross estate for estate tax purposes, and that's another purpose of trust. We're talking about income taxation in this video, but a trust can be used to actually um, avoid wealth transfer tax like the estate tax and also gift tax it can be a way to um, so that someone doesn't have to pay a ton of money in gift tax you can uh, plan through using the applicable exemption amount as well as um, the annual exclusion amount life insurance trusts are safeguards against the receipt of proceeds by a young or inexperienced beneficiary again you put on certain strings so that that person can't just get all the money and blow it all at Disney World but use it maybe towards um, a business later on in life or something more a wi better a wiser wiser decision. So another common trust is a living revocable trust. So this is during the life of the grantor. Revocable meaning that the grantor or whatever party is designated has the ability to revoke the trust at um, various points or any point. It's it's a, a way to manage assets. It reduces probate costs upon death. The probate process can be a um, a timely and a expensive process. This is a way to avoid that with respect to those items. It provides privacy for asset disposition. So you might not know the parties involved, protects against medical or other emergencies, and provides relief from necessity of day-to-day -day management of the underlying assets. Trust for minors. So this is the Disney. This is the Disney example I've been saying, right? This is a way that a lot of wealthy people that might have very young minors, you're not just going to give them one day a billion dollars. They'll blow it the wrong way. They'll blow it on, you know, they'll do something, you know, they're probably not going to be as wise as they're going to be later on in life. So there's various things. You can put age restrictions. Maybe they get a certain amount when they turn 21 or 18 or 35 or 30, various things, or maybe upon marriage or various events. This is a way that um, you can set money aside for college education and it can be, um, you know, this must be used for college. It shifts income to lower bracket taxpayers, but the kiddie tax is something you have to take into account because that might bring a, a wrench into it. And it allows parents to retain some control over the children's use of assets. And the main thing, again, is that 
Yes, you're you're putting money aside for security for your children or grandchildren or whatever party that might be younger than maybe you know when they make better decisions later on, but at least they know they'll have that security later on. A blind trust is where the grantor, without his or her input or influence, um, is the assets are held and managed. So an example is while the grantor holds political office or some other sensitive position where you can't have any type of um, you know strings attached to any type of organization where you or you're biased or have some connection. Retirement trust is a special trust that's tax exempt that manages assets um, of contributions under qualified retirement plans. Divorce trust. Uh, manages assets of an ex-spouse and ensures they'll be transferred on prescribed schedule. So if you set aside um, maybe property settlement over a certain period of time, you can put it into a divorce trust. Liquidation trust is where um, it's managed assets and final dissolution of a corporation undergoing a complete liquidation. Because sometimes the corporation or business might um, be liquidating over a plan over um, several years, so money is set aside in liquidation trust. So those are just some of the major types of trust. There's other ones out there. There's um, various special needs trusts for various parties. There's actually pet trusts. What if you have a pet and you want to put money aside for your pet upon your death? This is a very interesting issue. Um, there's been um, some interesting cases. Leona Helmsley with her dogs. They put money aside. There was a dog um, in Miami Beach called Conchita. You can look it up. The Gail Posner estate. I actually um, was. I had a fortune of uh, working on this uh, case or at least seeing some of the facts about it. It's, it's settled, obviously, but a very interesting case. You can look it up. Basically, um, all the issues, lots of issues related to pet trusts out there. It's a very interesting topic. You know, setting aside millions of dollars to your um, to your dogs, but you set aside barely any money to maybe your, your, physic, your actual children, your actual blood children. So, for example, one of the um, cases... Um, the Chihuahua got ten million dollars, and the actual son got about five hundred thousand dollars through a trust upon the um, the grantor's death. So interesting case. What is an estate? So an estate is created upon the death of every individual. Basically, the estate is really meant to um, once an individual dies, deals with okay, how do we wind up things? Okay, the individual had a bunch of assets. How are they going to be distributed? Through will, through trusts, through testamentary trusts? How, how, how are we going to be able to, is it going to be through inheritance law? How is the how are things going to be wound up? Various liabilities that might be owed, um, whatnot. Okay, that's what the estate is all about, is going through that process. It collects and conserves an individual's assets, satisfies all liabilities, and distributes the remaining assets to heirs. Now, in general, taxable income of trusts or estates is taxed to the entity or to its beneficiaries to the extent that each has received the accounting income of the entity. So you're going to see that even though we're talking about tax, we have to worry about accounting income, which is different from tax income. So whoever receives the accounting income of the entity or some portion of it is liable for the income tax that results. So we're going to talk about corpus versus um, income portions because accounting income has a big component of that. Now the filing requirements. The fiduciary of the estate or the trust must file a Form 1041, um, a U.S. income tax return for estates and trusts in the following situations. Now it's important to note that the Form 1041 on estates and trusts is for the income tax element. If you're dealing with the wealth transfer taxes for estate and gift tax, that's a different form and please see the wealth transfer video. For an estate with gross income of $600 or more for the year, they have to file. If it's less than that, then they don't. For a trust that either has any taxable income or if there's no taxable income, had gross income of $600 or more, half the file. The due date is the 15th day of the fourth month following the year end. So that would be the um, the same if it's a calendar year, be April 15th, just like an individual. Now the tax year for an estate is either calendar year or fiscal year. Um, and a trust, it's always going to be calendar year. So for a trust, it's always going to be due on April 15th. The fourth month of the the 15th day of the fourth month. So that's April 15th for the calendar year. And there are extensions that can be out there for um, filing that can be um, requested and whatnot. Now, just like individuals, estimated tax payments um, have to be made in obviously certain circumstances using the same schedule as individuals. Okay, that's important to understand. There's some special rules there I've noted, but that's all I want to mention about the estimated tax payments. 
So let's talk about accounting income. I mentioned this earlier. Accounting income is based on the controlling document, the estate, the trust controlling documents. Now, either the document or state law determines whether amounts are allocated to corpus or current income. That's very important. When you think of corpus, what we're talking about with corpus is we're talking about the body. So that's Latin corpus is body. And what we're talking about is the principal. Think about the principal. Let's say you own some bonds that pay interest every six months over, let's say they have a maturity date of six years. Well, the corpus is the actual principal amount of the bond. If it's a million dollar bond, the corpus will be a million dollars. The income is the interest that comes off the bonds. So that's what we mean by I mean current income. Well, if we're allocating amounts to corpus versus current income, current income obviously is taxable as gross income. Corpus is just simply a return of capital, if you will, or it just goes towards the capital. If the entity distributes income currently, that income should generally correspond to accounting income. So here are some common allocations that you normally see, and this is not always the case, again, because the document controls, and again, state law also can control. So items that are allocable to income are what we usually think, and these are the things that are obviously going to be gross income. Ordinary and operating net income from trust assets, interest, dividend, rent, royalty, there you go, that's what we normally think of when we think of that, that income off the item. Stock dividends, one half of fiduciary fees and commissions. Those are all allocable to income. Allocable to corpus, though, is depreciation on business assets, casualty gains, losses, insurance recoveries, capital gain, loss on investment, stock splits, and one half of fiduciary fees and commissions. So one half of the fiduciary fees commissions comes out of um, allocable income, and one half comes out of corpus. So not only is it a tax issue in terms of calculating gain or loss, when you're talking about accounting income, you're saying, okay, well, what is being increased? If we have some dividends, it's increasing the income. But if it's increase, but if it's um, depreciation, it's going to decrease corpus. If we have a gain, if we have a gain from casualty on income producing um, assets, it increases corpus. Because what could happen is in the um, the will or a various document, the corpus might be allocable to a certain party, but the income um, might be allocable to a different party. So one beneficiary might get the income off of. Um, the interest off of the bonds, but then after a certain period of time, maybe another party maybe um, gets the bond itself. So that's why it's important to understand income versus corpus. And also you have to worry about that for tax purposes because of various um, you know, tax recovery of capital and whatnot. Because obviously if it's interest, all that's considered taxable, but if it's a bond, well, that has some type of recovery of capital element because upon maturity, there might be some um, coupon amount or whatnot attached to that. So generally, estates and trusts act as conduits for income received and taxation at the beneficiary level. So at some point, think about it like a partnership where it's a flow through or an S corporation. It's a flow through, but you still have to go through the accounting income and the, t and the taxable income of the actual entity, the estate or trust. Okay, by the way, a state of trust is a taxpayer. I mentioned it as an entity. It's really, think of it as its own separate taxpayer. A state, a state is, a, is a type of taxpayer, a trust is a type of taxpayer. They are, they're separate from an individual, even though they're a flow through, if you will, through the sense of our conduit. This is codified um, through the allowance of distribution deduction, which we'll talk about. Now, there's some exceptions to this rule about the generally a state and trust act as conduits. And that's for a complex trust, which accumulates income for a specified time and estates um, that are not always required to make current distributions. Those are going to be taxable. And those can be very, uh, as, you, as you can see from the term, complex. In these cases or other cases where the entity is not required to distribute current income, the entity itself is taxed. So it doesn't simply just flow through to the, um, the parties. It, it actually is taxed itself. So property distributions, generally an entity does not have to recognize gain or loss. So you might be thinking back to like um, corporations where, remember when a, um, a, a C corporation uh, makes a property distribution, it has to um, it has to record gain or loss and has to take that into account. Well, it can only record gain, it can't recognize loss, right? That's the same issue here. Generally an, ent an entity does not have to recognize gain or loss, um, but the beneficiary takes the same basis in the asset as it had in the estate or trust. So that's a little different from corporate, the corporate rule. Distribution absorbs the DNI, which is the distributable net income, and qualifies for a distribution deduction to the extent of the lesser of basis of beneficiary or fair market, fair market value. 
Um, the trustee or the executor, though, can elect to recognize gains and losses on assets distributed in kind. So there can be an election, and if that's done, the beneficiary takes a basis equal to fair market value. So the rule here is, it, the general rule is, okay, the enti- the actual entity, the, the trust or estate, does not have to recognize gain or loss on the distribution. That's the general rule. But the catch is that the beneficiary takes a carryover basis. If there's an election that can be made where the trustee um, or the executor can say, okay, the entity is going to recognize gain or loss, and if that's the case, the beneficiary does take fair market value, which this is a, a rule similar to the um, corporations, the C-corporation rule on property distributions, except remember, C-corporations can never recognize a loss. Here you see they can. That's very interesting. And again, distribution absorbs the DNI, distributable net income, which we'll talk about distributable net income in a moment. Deductions. So all of because a state or trust is just like a general taxpayer, most of the individual rules apply to trusts and estates as well. But we have to adjust some things. So we'll talk about those. So deductions are allowed for ordinary and necessary expenses, just like we have for trader business and production of income. Right? We have ordinary, necessary, paid or incurred during the taxable year in carrying on trader business. That's what we're talking about here. So trader business, production of income, management, conservation, um, or maintenance of property, and determination, collection, or refund of any tax. So that's really the, the section 162 trader business and the section 212 production of income, management, conservation, and tax related item that we usually see. Okay, So that's very important to understand. Now, there's other deductions um, with respect. No deductions allowed for expenses related um, to the production or collection of tax-exempt income. So we saw that in the individual rule where um, tax-exempt income, you can't get a deduction. That's the case here, too. So that just flows over the normal rule. Cost recovery deductions are allocated proportionally to the recipients of accounting income. So we're talking about depreciation, amortization, those kind of things. Deductions are allowed for casualty or theft losses and NOLs. Wash sale and related party rules do apply. So um, those special wash sale and related party um, loss rules, they do apply to estates and trusts as well. Other deductions, they may be eligible for the um, domestic production activity deduction, which this, the D-pad, um, just so you know, some years this hasn't been allowed, other years it has. Please look at whether the D-pad, the domestic production, um, production activity deduction, is allowed to be taken normally. If it is, then a estate or trust will be allowed to. Charitable contribution deduction is allowed to the extent of amounts included in gross income for the year. Okay, now we're talking about distributable net income, which is a very important concept. So an entity is allowed a deduction for the distributions to beneficiaries. And this is how a simple trust or just a normal trust that's not complex can get away with not having to pay tax. It's taxed at the beneficiary or the um, actual the flow through level. So that it's through a, a, a deduction for distributable net income. So distributable net income is used to compute the amount of the deduction. There's a maximum amount of uh, the beneficiary can pay on tax. The character is preserved so it flows through um, and it's the maximum amount of the uh, distribution deduction. So we have some steps to calculate the DNI or the distributable net income. First, we determine the entity's taxable income before the distribution deduction. This includes all the entity's income, deductions, gain, losses, and it also includes personal exemption. Next, step two, we make the following adjustments to the entity's taxable income. So this is kind of similar to what we do when we um, do adjustments to corporations to get go from book to tax income. We have to add some adjustments. Also similar to the uh, the old uh, alternative minimum tax system that we um, that you might have heard about at one time. So we add back personal exemption, net tax exempt interest, and net capital losses. We subtract any net capital gains that are allocable to corpus. So for estates and complex trusts, the distribution deduction is the lesser of the deduction portion of DNI or the taxable amount actually distributed. For a simple trust, though, the full distribution is always assumed. It's just pretty much pro rata. So the entity's taxable income is calculated as follows. We, We start with the entity taxable income before the distribution deduction. Then we subtract out the distribution deduction, and that gives the entity taxable income. So if we have a simple trust, guess what? It's going to be zero because that dis- distribution deduction will equal and it will be- it'll flow through to all the different owners, well not owners, the, the parties that get that portion. So 
Um, how do we allocate the distributable net income deduction? Okay, or the just distributable net income of the parties. Um, the deduction goes to the actual entity, the estate or trust. The distributable net income goes to the various parties, the beneficiaries, and whatnot. So each type of DNI must be allocated proportionally to the income beneficiaries. So this prevents manipulation of tax liabilities by assigning, for example, tax exempt income to a high bracket and tax taxable income to a low bracket. So if you've um, looked into partnership tax with the substantial economic effect, where you're not allowed to uh, play games with the various taxpayers with the substantive um, effect issue, well, this is very similar to that issue. It's very similar to substantive um, or substantial part of the substantial economic effect requirements of the um, the the partnership uh, rules, partnership tax rules. You can't allocate certain things to one or the other. It has to be proportionate to the income beneficiaries. The amount taxable beneficiaries for a simple trust, DNI is always the taxable uh, maximum amount. It may be less if the DNI ex, um, includes tax exempt interest. If more than one income beneficiary, we apportion elements of DNI rateably. Again, for simple trusts, it's all about rateable proportionate. The amount of the ta that's taxable to beneficiaries for estates and complex trusts, though, we have to use a two tier system. So if we have a simple trust, we simply just use pro rata, and the maximum amount is the DNI. That's what's taxable to beneficiaries. But if it's an estate, or a complex trust, we use a two-tier system. The first tier is income that's required to be distributed as categorized. The second is all other amounts of property paid, credited, or required to be distributed. So for the first tier, if that's, if that's all we have, if we only have first tier, so we, we don't have any second tier, we only have first tier, which again is the income that's required to be distributed. If we only have first tier, we use the following formula. We do the first tier distributions to the beneficiary over the first tier distributions to all. We multiply that by the distributable net income, and that gives the beneficiary share of distributable net income. If we have both first and second tier distributions, and the first tier distributions exceed the DNI, we use the previous formula to allocate the first tier distributions, which is right here. We just saw this. First tier distributions to the beneficiary over first tier di distributions to all beneficiaries times the distributable net income equals the beneficiary share of distributable net income. Now, that's for the first tier um, distributions. Again, it ha those have to exceed DNI. The second tier distributions are not taxed since all DNI has been allocated to the first tier because we do first tier approach. It's that, it's that ordering rule. We start with first tier. We use our formula, right? And then the second tier, well, we don't have enough because it already exceeded DNI. So the idea is that you're trying to use up the DNI for that respective um, party. Now, if we have first and second tier, but the first tier do not exceed DNI, but the total of both the first and second tier does exceed DNI, the second tier beneficiaries recognize income as shown below. So first what we do is we go through and we give that full amount to the first tier, but then the second tier, we start with the second tier distributions um, to beneficiary over second tier distributions to all times the remaining distributable net income after the first tier. So what we do is we give the full amount of the DNI to, uh, I'm sorry, we give the full amount of the first tier distributions, we allocate all DNI to that. And whatever's left gets allocable in the second step, and that's going to be the portion of the um, beneficiary share from that second tier. So a specific beneficiary will get the full amount of the first tier as, as taxable through DNI, and then whatever's left will use this formula. That's the idea. There is a separate share rule for the sole purpose of determining the amount of DNI for a complex trust and estate. So again, not a simple trust, complex trust or estate with more than one beneficiary. The substantially separate independent shares of, of different beneficiaries in the trust or estate are treated as separate trusts or estates. So this makes things really difficult. And I'm not going to go into the specifics because again, this is meant to be basic. I just want to mention that. The separate share rule is designed to prevent the inequity that results if the corpus payments are treated under the regular rules applicable to second tier beneficiaries also results in the availability of extra entity personal exemptions and in greater use of lower entity tax brackets. Character of income. So there's various classes of income that retain their character and flow through to the beneficiaries, just like we have with the flow through entity. So if it's, it's various flow through items, think of it like separately stated, it flows through. If all the DNI is distributed and there are multiple beneficiaries, allocation must be made among various classes of beneficiaries. So this really sums up the basic elements 
of the income taxation of estates and trusts. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you haven't watched the wealth transfer tax video, I strongly recommend watching that now because it shows you that this video focuses on income tax and the wealth transfer focuses on the taxation um, of estates um, and gifts upon those events. So I hope you've enjoyed this video and please watch more videos in the future.